Um, I'm Spaytalk, and I'm a solutions engineer at Google, and I work closely with Dataflow, and I'll be uh, specifically deep diving into the GCP Dataflow architecture. And so this is the first of uh, many sessions today, and I want this sort of to be the foundational building block of, um, you know, what carries you on for the rest of the day. Um, you know, the rest of the day will be a little more deeper dives into some of the topics that we touch on in this talk. So I have three goals of this talk. So first, I want to cover the Dataflow runner architecture. Um, additionally, I want to touch on some core features that GCP has introduced uh, into the Dataflow runner um, to make running your beam pipelines more seamless. And finally, I want to talk about some horizontal integrations um, you know, that your beam pipelines can work with other parts of GCP to make, um, again, running your beam pipelines as simple as possible. Awesome. So Dataflow is a managed service by uh, Google Cloud. And first, I want to touch on sort of four key aspects of Cloud Dataflow. So there's graph optimization, there's monitoring, there's logging, and then there's also resource auto-scaling that's sort of a recurrent theme throughout. So I'll try to touch on that as well um, you know, throughout this talk. So to start with graph optimization, um, a lot of it you know, sometimes you can you have optimizations with how you're running your pipeline. So you can have maybe a consumer producer, uh, you know, fusion, for example, or a sibling fusion. And I don't want to get too detailed into uh, these, but you can sort of think of graph optimization uh, sort of like compiler optimization. So it's going to be optimized uh, to help you run your beam pipelines uh, with, you know, minimal resources and as timely as possible. So the next thing Cloud Dataflow has to offer is the actual uh, UI itself. And so you can navigate to this uh, you know, via the Pantheon UI and you can click on a Dataflow job ID that you know, represents one of your Beam pipelines running. And the first thing you'll see is actually the steps of your Beam pipeline. So you'll have your source all the way to your sync and everything in between. Um, you can also see some job metrics uh, if you click on another tab in that UI. And you can see some key metrics here, such as CPU utilization and uh, you know memory usage, for example, memory consumption. And on the right pane, you can see um, some other key metrics, for example, some key uh, metrics about your steps. So if you were to actually click on a step on the right pane, it would show uh, you know what the wall time of that step might be, or what the throughput might be of that step. And um, you know as you scroll down, you can also see some things such as uh, some experiments you've passed into your Beam pipeline. Um, and finally, on the bottom, you can see that there's a little preview of, uh, you know, logging. And so if we expand this out, logging is actually going to be our centralized repository of, you know, where we keep track of what happened in our beam pipeline. And so, you know, logging will contain things from, you know, your info level logs all the way up to like maybe your error level logs. And this shows sort of anything and everything that's happening in your pipeline. And so oftentimes when, you know, there might be an issue in your pipeline, Logging is the first place, uh, you know, we go to see, you know, what might have happened uh, during this time. And yeah, it shows basically a bunch of information about your, your workers that are executing, uh, you know, this data flow job, which, and workers are essentially just these compute engine VMs. Cool. So next, I want to get into some integrations uh, with other GCP services. And in specific, I want to cover integrations with Cloud IAM, Compute Engine, and Cloud Networking. So at a very high level, what happens first is you have your Beam Pipeline that you've written out, and you're going to submit this to what we call a regional endpoint. And a regional endpoint you can think of as your primary, your primary worker. So this is going to be the worker that's not executing the work, but it's sort of resource provisioning and um, understanding what needs to be done to actually execute uh, your job. At the same time, this pipeline code is going to be sent to GCS and Google, Google Cloud Storage. And Google Cloud Storage is going to hold common resources that uh, the workers actually executing your work will need to access. And so once you have submitted this to your regional endpoint, your regional endpoint, or uh, also known as your primary, your primary worker, is going to lease out work to your secondary workers. And your secondary workers are going to be the ones that are actually doing the work. And so the secondary workers, like I just mentioned in the previous slide, are all compute engine VMs. Great. So 
we have our regional endpoint and we have zones. So a little bit of terminology here. So regional endpoints, um, you can uh, you can think of this as what uh, we just mentioned to the primary worker. So it maps to the primary worker in the sense that it doesn't actually do the work for you, but it actually provisions the work. And so, um, you know, the region is set to US Central 1 by default, but uh, you can override this. And then your zone is going to correspond to your secondary data flow workers, which are going to be the compute engine VMs actually carrying out the work. And so this is going to define, um, yeah, the zone is going to define the location of the data flow workers. And, uh, you know, it's going to default to a zone uh, based in the region selected. But of course, you might not want this for various reasons, such as the ones that are, you know, listed on the slide. Um, for example, uh, data locality or geographic separation. Um, but just do keep in mind that if your primary worker is in one region and your secondary workers are sort of in a zone outside of that region, there could be some delay just based on, um, you know, network network latency. So with Dataflow uh, in Cloud IAM, there's two uh, minimum of two service accounts that need to be provisioned um, to successfully execute a job. And you can think of these also as sort of just mapping to that primary worker and the secondary workers. So for example, you have your Dataflow service account, um, and this is going to be mapping to your primary worker. So this is going to be used for worker creation, monitoring, et cetera. And then you have your controller service account, which is going to map to the secondary workers that are actually carrying out the work. So this is going to um, you know, give you the this is going to provision you to access resources uh, that you might need uh, for your pipeline. For example, files from that GCS bucket that um, was shown on a few slides before. And oftentimes, uh, sort of as a side note, we do see uh, you know a lot of people that use Dataflow either don't give these uh, service accounts the right permissions, or sometimes they're not um, you know completely in understanding of why they you know that two service accounts are even needed in the first place. Great, so now I'm gonna talk about some newer features that uh, we've introduced in Cloud Dataflow recently. So in distributed data processing, there's this common problem of a hotkey issue. And you can think of this as um, essentially your primary worker is gonna lease out work to these secondary workers to actually do your job. And sometimes you know, the primary worker will assign a lot of work to one secondary worker and not enough work to the other secondary worker. And this, this is going to cause sort of an imbalance, and this is going to, um, you know, delay the parallelization process, um, which is actually going to, you know, hinder your job performance. So um, this, is, this is called as the hotkey issue, or this is called a sharding uh, sometimes. So what we've done is we've actually uh, introduced a feature called batch dynamic work distribution that's going to actually just redistribute the hotkeys um, for a better workload distribution. And this is all fully automated on our end. So another feature we have is the Dataflow shuffle service for, for service for batch jobs. So you can consider a pipeline running where you're, you know, you have your steps from your sources to your sink, and you have your source, and perhaps you have, uh, you know, a resource intensive step such as uh, group by or co-group by. Um, this is going to be this when it gets to this point, it's going to send that over to the shuffle service. The shuffle service is going to, um, you know make the computation and it's going to send it back to your data flow pipeline and your data flow pipeline data flow pipeline will continue um, as normal and analogously we have something uh, for the data flow streaming engine so the streaming engine um, same idea here you have your data flow pipeline running um, you may have um, some resource intensive steps that you want to send to the streaming engine Streaming engine is going to take care of the computation, send it back to your data flow pipeline, and your pipeline is going to keep progressing. Um, and yeah, this is this is really helping out three key things. So auto scaling for one, um, just based on you know your your worker resources, right? You can you can provision out less worker resources. Um, this does provide uh, you know smoother auto scaling. So another thing we have is our Dataflow SQL UI. And so you can think of this as Beam SQL, essentially. So you can write SQL code to trigger a Dataflow job. And this is, this is really nice because uh, this doesn't require you to have an extensive Java background or a Python background uh, to trigger a job. You can simply do it via SQL. Um, and yeah, so D Dataflow SQL is essentially the same as Beam SQL. Um, and for example, if you're using GCP, you might run this on um, you know, BigQuery, for example, which is our uh, analytical warehouse.
So another feature we have is flexible resource scheduling. And so um, to get into a little bit of background, we have our standard VMs, but we also have what we call preemptible VMs, which are for sort of short-lived um, time on the VM. So the VMs can shut down after, say, a period of 24 hours. Uh, they're ephemeral, essentially. So um, the idea is that we have a combination of these standard VMs and these preemptible VMs to run your job. And so even if the preemptible VMs go down, there's you know other VMs that are sort of still working um, on the job. And this is pretty useful just from a resource management standpoint. Uh, you know, you'll eventually, the, the bills will kind of come down because your standard VMs, you won't have standard VMs just sort of running all the time. Another thing we have is data flow templates. And so this is uh, really useful, first of all, because it doesn't require um, coding. So this makes it accessible to many more people. Um, Another key thing here is that you don't have to recompile your code every time you want to uh, run your job. So you can select one of you know 20 plus Google provided templates, or you can create your own. Um, you have popular ETL sources and syncs. Um, you can run this on both streaming and batch jobs. And yeah, the key here is that you don't have uh, to recompile this every time you want to run your job. And this is useful because you don't have to have your dev environment, uh, you know, or all the dependencies sort of set up to actually compile that code. Uh, this can run. Uh, standalone. Great. So I've talked about sort of some architecture from Dataflow, um, introduced some things like DAG optimization, and also some key features that we've introduced recently, such as the templates, uh, you know, the SQL UI, uh, streaming engine and shuffle service. Um, and of course, we have monitoring and logging, which is sort of our centralized repository um, when we want to sort of troubleshoot our pipeline or just understanding what's gone on. So I think with that, we can go to any questions.